Welcome back to the Stock Market Basics course. My name is Tom Vylord. Today we're going over Section 4, Placing the Trade. We do talk about a couple companies in this section, and this is to be taken as illustrative and educational purposes only. Please remember, we are not your financial advisors, so we can't give you specific investment advice. Now, here's a quote that I really believe in. Investing is simple. It really is. It's the financial industry that works hard to make it complex. Here's what we're going to learn in this section. We're going to talk about the different types of brokerage firms you can work with, the account types to open up at those brokerage firms, talk about the ticker symbol, why it's important to look at the volume on any stock you are considering investing in, also look at the bid and the ask, and then the different types of transactions, a market order, a limit order, and a stop order. Now that you have the basics down, it's almost time to buy some shares of stock, finally. Before you do, there's still a few more things that you should be familiar with before placing your first trade. You've researched a company and made the decision that it could be a worthwhile investment, and now it's time to place a trade. But how or where do you do this? Before you deposit your first dollar into your trading account, you need to open an account with a brokerage firm. A brokerage firm is a financial institution that facilitates the buying and selling of securities such as stocks between a buyer and a seller. A broker is the person you deal with at the brokerage firm who helps you place that trade. They take your order and they send that order to an exchange where stocks and other securities are bought and sold. Traditionally speaking, a broker refers to a person who does this for you. He or she may even make recommendations for you. However, a broker isn't always a live person. Thanks to the internet, a broker can also be an online trading platform where the trades are placed using just your computer or your smartphone. There are a few types of brokerage firms, so you need to determine which one is right for you. And the three main types are wirehouse firms, independent brokers, and then your online brokers. A wirehouse firm is a brokerage firm with multiple offices located nationally and is considered to be a full-service firm. Usually a wirehouse brokerage firm accepts clients who meet certain investable dollar account minimums. Sometimes the account minimums are $50,000, sometimes they're $100,000 account minimums or more. For the service, investors have access to recommendations, proprietary products, research and order execution, which just means placing a trade. Fees can be commissions when you buy and or sell securities, or it can be an asset under management fee, which is often about 1% annually of the assets under management with their company. There's also nuisance fees to be aware of, such as account maintenance fees, statement processing fees, statement mailing fees, and then if your account falls below the minimum account value, they'll charge you a below minimum asset fee. Some of the more recognizable names in this category would be Morgan Stanley, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo, and UBS. Next is an independent brokerage firm. This is a brokerage firm where the broker has more investment options available to offer their investors. Since an independent broker is not tied to a wirehouse firm, they are not required to sell proprietary products, nor do they even have proprietary products to sell. These proprietary products that some of the wirehouse firms push, many times they're subpar performers. An advantage that an investor will have when dealing with an independent broker would be much lower fees, usually, many more investment options to choose from, and more personal service. A disadvantage of using an independent broker's firm is that you do not have access to the research that many wirehouse firms offer. Thanks to free services such as Yahoo Finance, Morningstar, etc., this is no longer a major disadvantage. Fees associated with independence are commissions to buy and or sell securities, or the advisor will charge an asset under management fee. Many of the nuisance fees do not exist at the independent channel. And third, you have the online brokerage firm. These firms offer brokerage services to investors simply using the internet. The main service offered is order execution. This type of brokerage firm is geared towards investors who wish to invest on their own and do not need the help of an advisor. If you're a beginner in the investing world, then you may need the guidance of a wirehouse or an independent broker to help you along. However, once you're experienced, and you'll be experienced after completing our courses, you will no longer need the services of an advisor. You'll be able to do this on your own, thus you won't need to pay their higher commissions or asset under management fees. Since this is a do-it-yourself platform, the costs are going to be substantially lower, and the main fee will be low commissions when you buy and sell a security. 
Now that you've selected a brokerage firm that suits your needs, the next thing you need to determine is which type of an account you want holding your investments. There are several types of account types, but the two most common are qualified and non-qualified. A qualified account is an account where the investor has certain tax advantages, such as tax deferral on income and capital appreciation, earned on the investments held within the account. Some examples of qualified accounts would be, but not limited to, IRAs and Roth IRAs. Qualified accounts offer many advantages. First, being able to earn income and capital appreciation without paying taxes until you make a withdrawal is a huge long-term advantage. This helps to boost your ability to build up your retirement nest egg. Deducting contributions can also give you a big upfront tax break as well. Let's take a look at an example of how tax-deferred growth can really boost your nest egg. Assume two investors are saving $5,500 a year for the next 15 years. Investor A puts that money into an IRA, which is tax-deferred, and then investor B puts the money into an account that does not offer the same tax-deferral benefits. This is going to be a taxable account. Also going to assume that the investments grow at 8% annually. Investor A is going to put $5,500 and grow 8% every year tax-free for the next 15 years. Investor B invests the same amount, but only $4,125 gets invested, and that's because we're assuming 25% was deducted for federal income taxes. In addition to the federal income taxes, Investor B also has to pay 15% annually on qualified dividends and capital appreciation, netting him or her just a 6.8% return annually. At the end of year 15, here are the results. Investor A grew their portfolio at 8% annually to $166,784 thanks to tax-deferred growth. Investor B had to pay taxes each year. Their portfolio grew annually at 6.8% net of taxes to $113,140. Qualified accounts are a great way to save for the long term, especially for retirement. However, it's not a perfect plan. Here are some of the drawbacks. In order to receive the tax-deferred benefits, investors must not withdraw money prior to the age of 59 and a half. If they do take money out prior to that age, the withdrawal can be costly. First, there's a 10% penalty on any money taken out of a qualified account prior to age 59 and a half. Second, once that money is withdrawn, it no longer has the advantages of tax-deferred growth. And third, anything withdrawn from a qualified account is considered taxable income. You're not going to have to pay income taxes on the money that was withdrawn from your qualified account. And assume you're in the 25% tax bracket and you took out $15,000, here's the total penalty. So you took money out prior to age 59 and a half, that's a 10% penalty, that's $1,500 gone. Next, you owe money for income taxes. Assuming you're in the 25% tax bracket, now you owe $3,375. That's $4,875 lost due to penalties and taxes from a $15,000 withdrawal. Finally, the money withdrawn from the qualified account will go towards your total annual income and could potentially bump you up into a higher tax bracket. In the previous example, we assumed you were in the 25% tax bracket. Depending on how much money you withdrew and how close you are to the higher tax bracket, that could potentially bump you up from, say, 25% tax bracket to a 28% tax bracket. Obviously, this would result in even higher earned income tax liabilities. The lesson here is simple. If you have a goal to save for the long term, that's after the age of 59 and a half, and you do not and will not ever take the money out sooner, then qualified accounts have obvious long-term accumulation benefits. If you do have a need to access some or all of your investable savings, then a non-qualified account would be more suitable. I just want to throw this disclaimer out there. This is a basics course. There are many qualifying events that will allow you to take money out of a qualified account without being penalized, but that topic is well beyond the scope of this course. There's also a lot of different types of qualified plans, such as a 403B, 401K, etc., and that also goes beyond the scope of this course. If you want more information regarding those topics, please go to our Retirement Planning Boot Camp course. A non-qualified account is not eligible for tax deferral benefits. In a non-qualified account, if you invest in an investment that pays a dividend, you'll have to pay taxes in the year in which that dividend was received. If you sell a position that has a capital gain, you'll have to pay either long-term or short-term capital gains. Long-term capital gains are realized when a security is sold for a profit and the holding period is longer than one year. As of 2008, the long-term capital gains are taxed at a maximum rate of 20%. Short-term capital gains are realized when a security is sold for a profit and the holding period is one year or less. 
Short-term capital gains are taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. Non-qualified accounts are very useful for the following reasons. If you're saving for the long term and you think that you may need access to some of those funds prior to age 59 and a half, then a non-qualified account will fit this need. Taxation on non-qualified accounts are only taxed on dividend income received and realized gains on the investments. And the tax rates can be more favorable. If you sell an investment after holding it for an entire year, the capital gains tax rate is just 20% as opposed to the current income tax bracket, which oftentimes are higher than 20%. Short-term capital gains in a non-qualified account and most qualified accounts are taxed at that higher rate, which is your current income tax bracket. Another advantage is that you can invest in certain types of investment vehicles that are not available in qualified accounts. One of my favorite types of trades for income are options, calls and puts. You're going to learn more about these in our option trading bootcamp course. Many of these trades are available in non-qualified accounts, but you can't do them in a qualified account. The typical retirement saver having a mix of qualified and non-qualified accounts is best to provide balance and flexibility. That way, you know you can always access some of your money in case of an emergency, while also taking advantage of the tax benefits for your long-term assets. Next, we're going to show you just a few more things you should be aware of before you click that confirm button to send your order to buy stock. The ticker symbol is a group of letters that identify a particular stock listed on an exchange. When a business decides to take the company public and accept capital from outside investors, it will select its ticker symbol. This ticker symbol, also known as ticker, some people even just call it a symbol, will be used by investors when placing trades for that company. Publicly traded companies that trade on the New York Stock Exchange will have up to three letters in their ticker. For example, the letter T is the ticker symbol for AT&T, DE is the ticker for John Deere and Company, and DIS is the ticker for Walt Disney. If the company has a four-letter ticker symbol, that means it trades on the NASDAQ. AAPL is a ticker symbol for Apple, and AMZN is a ticker that identifies Amazon. Other types of tickers exist for mutual funds. These are usually represented by five letters, ending with a letter X. Options trades have tickers that represent the underlying company, as well as a character to represent the expiration date and whether it is a put or call contract. When placing your trade, you'll want to enter the symbol that's associated with the company in which you're going to acquire shares. You can go to any free financial data reporting site such as Yahoo Finance to get this information. And as you can see in the previous slide, when you enter the ticker symbol into a site like Yahoo Finance, you're going to get a lot of useful information. So number one was the company name. In this example is Facebook. Number two, it tells you what exchange it's listed on. Facebook is listed on the NASDAQ. The current stock price is $142.21. The bid and the ask are slightly different. We'll explain that in a second. The bid is $142.52, whereas the ask is $142.57. And there's a lot of shares being traded for Facebook. The volume as of today is 14,636,672 shares. All the other data on this page is very important, but we'll go over that in greater detail in the next course, the Value Investing and Options Trading course. And next, we want to take a look at the trading volume. We want to make sure we're buying shares of companies that have plenty of trading volume. This is the number of shares that are being traded on any given day for a particular company. In the previous slide, we're showing you data for Facebook, and there were more than 14 million shares traded that day. Very important to look at because as you do your research, you may find a small company that's growing at a fast rate, looks really good, and may also be undervalued. So it sounds like it could be a potential opportunity. However, there might not be a big market for that stock. What does this mean? When you look at any financial website to get a price of stock, you get a single price. Here, we're looking at Apple, and as of today, it's $221.34 per share. However, that's not the price you get. That quoted price is usually the average between the bid and the ask. The bid price is the price a buyer is willing to pay for a stock, and the ask is the price a seller is willing to sell their stock. If you're buying a stock, you're going to pay the higher price, which is the ask. And if you're selling stock you own, you're going to get the lower price, which is known as the bid. And if there's a difference between the bid and the ask, that's called the spread. We do not want to buy a stock that has a big spread. It means it's not liquid. Take a look at this quote for Disney. The current price is $110.65. However, that's not the price we're going to pay if we buy it right now. The bid's $110.30, and the ask is $111 even. The average is $10.65, which is the quoted price. The spread is the difference between the bid and the ask. 
And in this example, it's a 70 cent spread. As I'm writing this, the market's closed. And after hours, the spreads are bigger. But during the trading day, a company like Disney, which traded 8.4 million shares a day, will be much smaller. Most likely, it's only going to be a couple cents. When you buy Disney, you're getting the higher price, which is the ask price. So in this example, we're going to be buying shares at $111 a share, not the quoted price of $110.65. And if you're selling your shares, you're selling them at the bid price of $110.30, not the quoted price of $110.65. Here's how that can hurt you. Here's a company called Leap Therapeutics. I don't know anything about them. don't know if they're good or bad. I just happen to see this on the NASDAQ biggest decliners list. It's had a bad day. As you can see here, the last quoted price was $6.42. The volume of the stock is just 25,000 shares. The price is $6.42, but that's not the price you pay if you buy it. Take a look at the bid and the ask. The asking price is $14, bucks, and the bid is only $4.68. You will be buying this quoted $6 stock for $14. Bucks. Not quite what you expected to pay, is it? If you had to sell it shortly after buying it, you would get a sell price of only $4.68. Because the stock is so thinly traded, the spread is ridiculous $9.32. That's a crazy spread, and that's why we need to take a look at volume to make sure that there's a market for any stock we're considering investing in. We prefer companies that have as little a spread as possible because a smaller spread means there's a big trading market for it. The worst thing to happen is that when you buy a company that either didn't work out and you want to cut your losses, but when you sell the stock, you realize there isn't a big market for the company. So you're either going to be stuck with it, or you'll be selling it at a much lower price than expected. And the other scenario is that you want to take gains on the stock that you own, but it's a thinly traded stock. So when you go to sell it, you may be giving up all of your gains because the spread is so big. That spread is a very good indicator of liquidity. If there's just a one or two cent spread, then the company is very liquid. Meaning, there's enough shares exchanged each and every day to be sure that the price you are buying or selling is very close to the quoted price. If the spread is large, then the company isn't very liquid. So when you go to buy the stock, you'd be buying it at a much higher price than expected. If you sell it, you'd be selling it at a much lower price than expected. To avoid this risk, our rule of thumb is we're only going to buy shares of companies that have a minimum number of half a million shares traded daily. This can be found on Morningstar.com, Yahoo Finance, with a brokerage firm's trading platform that you're using to place the trade. Lastly, there are a few ways in which you can place your trade when you buy or sell your shares. Several different types, and the most common would be a market order, a limit order, and a stop order. A market order is a buy or sell order that's to be executed immediately at current market prices. As long as there are willing sellers and buyers, market orders are filled right away. Market orders are used when you want to be sure the order is filled. This is more important than buying or selling at a specific price. Market order is the simplest and most basic type of trade order. As you'll learn in the previous slides, trading volume and liquidity are very important as you want to be able to get into and out of a stock at a favorable price. Since most large company stocks and ETFs, exchange traded funds, have liquidity, market orders are filled instantaneously. However, if you're intending to buy or sell a stock with very little liquidity, it could take some time for the order to get filled if it does get filled. As you learn with the bid and ask spreads for thinly traded companies, you could get filled at a very costly price. When you enter a market order, your filled price is dictated by the market, not you. If you want to have more control of entering or exiting a trade at a specific price, then you may want to consider a limit or a stop order. A limit order is an order to buy or sell security at a specific price or better. Let's say you want to buy shares of XYZ. And you want to buy their shares at $50 a share and the current price is $50.49. So you don't want to buy it at the current price, you want to come down a little bit before you get in. A limit order will only fill your order if XYZ becomes available at $50 or less. This is called a buy limit order. Now, if you want to sell shares of XYZ at $50 and the current price is $49.75, you want the stock to come up a little bit before you execute it, a limit order will only fill your order if XYZ becomes available at $50 or more. This is called a sell limit order. Limit orders are great because they give the investor more control over the price in which their trade gets filled. Unlike a market order, where the order is automatically filled, certain conditions must be met before a limit order is executed. If those conditions are not met, then your order may not ever get filled. In the previous buy limit order example, if XYZ does not fall to $50 by the time your limit order expires, 
your order to buy XYZ will not be filled. In the sell limit example, if it does not rise to $50 by the time your limit order expires, your order to sell XYZ will not be filled. The investor gets to choose how long that order remains open. Sometimes you may want that order open just until the close of the current business day, and this is common if you're trading a stock during earnings. Another common time period you may select is called a GTC order, which stands for Good Till Cancel. This means that you want your order to remain open until the stock reaches your desired price or until you tell the broker to cancel the order. It's very important to know that when you place a limit order, there's no guarantee that your order will be filled. However, it does ensure that you will not miss the opportunity to buy or sell at your desired price if it does, in fact, reach that target price. Next is a stop order. This is an order to buy or sell a stock once the price of the stock reaches a specific price. Once the stop price is reached, a stop order becomes a market order. A buy stop order is entered at a stop price above the current market price. I use sell stop orders all the time, but I do not like to use buy stop orders. A buy stop order is used if an investor thinks that XYZ, which is currently trading at $50 a share, will continue to go up. If that prediction is correct, they're going to place a buy stop order at a price higher than $50, let's say $55 a share. Once XYZ hits $55, the investor's order becomes a market order, and they'll enter into XYZ at a price near $55. The thought process here is that if a security climbs to a target price, it's going to continue to climb even higher levels. The risk of doing that's obvious. You may be buying an appreciating asset at its peak. In my opinion, and the reason I don't use buy stop orders, I prefer to know what a stock is worth and buy into it before it has risen to new heights. And this is what we're going to teach you in the Value Investing and Options Trading course in sections number 7, section 8, and section 9. We're going to teach you how to properly value a stock so that you know what it's worth and that you can buy with confidence before it goes up, not after, as is the strategy using a buy stop order. A much more practical use for a buy stop order is to protect against the potential unlimited losses associated with short selling. Short selling means that you're predicting a stock's going to go down in value. And to sell short, you need to borrow shares from your brokerage firm, and these borrowed shares will eventually have to be returned. If you borrow shares you do not own, you have to buy those shares back and return them eventually to the brokerage firm. If you borrow shares at $50 a share, your hope is that the stock falls in price. If that occurs, you're going to be able to buy back their shares at a lower price, and the difference in price is your profit. So for example, we own 100 shares of XYZ from Main Street Brokerage at $50 a share. Some bad news caused XYZ to fall from 50 down to 40, and we would go in, buy 100 shares of XYZ at 40, and return these shares to the brokerage firm. The $10 difference from where we sold it to where we bought it is our gain. Sounds easy enough, but what if the stock doesn't fall? When you're short selling, the maximum return is if the underlying stock falls to zero. But your risk is unlimited, and theoretically, a stock has unlimited upside. And we've seen that with Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon. It seems like they've done nothing but go up over time. If a stock goes as high as the moon, we would have lost an enormous amount of money. To limit that potential loss, we would place a buy stop above the current price of the stock. If we place a buy stop order at $55 a share, we're limiting our losses to approximately $5. The sell stop is entered at a stop price below the current market price. For example, I bought shares of XYZ at $50 a share. It appreciated nicely and now it's at $62.50. I want to protect my profits from a sudden decline. So to protect my profits and lock in gains, I'm going to enter into a sell stop order, also known as a stop loss. And I'm going to enter that at a price below $62.50. I'd be very happy to walk away with a 15% rate of return. And in this case, I'd place my stop order at $57.50. If XYZ continues to climb, the stop order does not get executed. I keep making money. But if it does fall from its current price down to $57.50, then my stop order becomes a market order. Since it becomes a market order, this means the order will not necessarily be filled at the exact stop price. As a market order, the executed price may be better or worse than the stop price. Once it's a market order, it's going to be executed at the very next tick, whether it's up or down. If XYZ is a liquid stock, my sell price may be $57.51, $57.49, or anywhere close in that ballpark. However, if XYZ is not liquid, my market order price will be much further away than my intended sell price at $57.50. This is just one more reason why it's very imperative that any stock you consider investing in has a very liquid market. 
As long as 500,000 shares are traded daily, this shouldn't be too much of an issue. Sell stop orders, aka stop loss, can also be used to limit losses on a new position. If I purchase XYZ today at $50, my hope is that my analysis is correct and the stock appreciates. However, I want to cover my butt if I'm incorrect. If I place a stop loss at $45 a share, then my losses are limited if XYZ declines after I purchase it. Investors generally use a sell stop order to protect a profit on a stock they own or to limit a loss. There's no one strategy that's perfect. They all have their advantages and they have their disadvantages. The disadvantage with a stop order is that there is not a 100% guarantee of getting the desired entry or exit points. If a stock gaps up or down, your stop order may be filled at a price significantly higher or lower than expected. A gap up occurs when a stock, or the entire market, opens the next trading day significantly higher than the previous trading day's closing price. And this can occur for the following reasons. Great economic news, positive earnings, positive earnings surprise, acquisition, new product success. This chart here shows two examples of gaps. The left side of the chart shows a gap down. So here is where the market closed. And then sometime between the close of the market and when the market opened up the next day, there was some bad news that caused the stock to fall from this price point all the way down to here when it opened up the next trading day. And the other type of gap is a gap up. So here, the market closed at this point. And sometime after the market closed and before it opened up the next trading day, had some good news. And the stock rose nicely from this price point all the way up to here which gave you a little bit of a gap. A gap down occurs when a stock, or the entire market, opens the next trading day significantly lower than the previous day's closing price. And there's a lot of reasons why this can happen. It could be because of poor economic news, poor earnings, another terrorist attack, resignation or health issue with a CEO, the company could be in a major lawsuit, experience a major data breach, new product failure, fraud, etc. Here's how a gap up can hurt you. Assume XYZ is trading at $50 a share, that's my favorite example, and we're short selling security. We want the stock to go down in order to make a profit. We're going to enter a buy stop order at 55 to limit losses if the stock goes up. As the market closed, that closing price for XYZ was $53 a share. Sometime during the after hours trading or the pre market trading, some very good news occurred, and the next day XYZ opened up at $63. Here's what happens. Our buy stop order turns into a market order once it hit 55. Since the very next tick, the market opens up around $63 a share, that is where we're going to get filled at. We're going to get filled close to 63, not $55 a share, and that can hurt us. Here's how a gap down can hurt. Assume XYZ is trading at $50 a share, and we are long the stock. Being long means we own it and we want it to go up. So we're going to enter a sell stop order to protect us on the downside. And we're going to enter that order at $45 a share to limit losses on the stock if it goes down. As the market closed, closing price for XYZ was right around $50 a share. Didn't move a whole lot. But sometime during the after hours trading or the next pre market trading, very bad news occurred. And a couple things happened. The CEO resigned. They had a data breach. And their new soft drink caused immediate impotence in men. So some really bad news. And the stock got crushed. The next trading day, XYZ opens up at $39. Our sell stop order turns into a market order. Once it hits 45, since it had a gap down, it opened up well below 45, and the next tick was at $39 a share. Now it's a market order, you get filled at that price. So we got filled at a price close to 39, not 45. Stop orders on individual securities can be advantageous, but as you can see here, they can also be dangerous, so proceed with caution. I prefer to use a strategy on ETFs. ETFs are made up of several stocks within one fund. As such, if a company does have a gap up or a gap down, the rest of the holdings within that fund will balance things out. This balancing out effect reduces the risk of gaps. Therefore, stop orders are significantly more reliable with these diversified securities. And here is your learning activity for this section. I want you to use the three companies on your watch list and look at the bid and the ask. Is there a wide spread or is the spread just a penny or two? Next, look at the average daily trading volume. Make sure the average daily trading volume is over 500,000 shares traded each day. If not, you need to find a couple of new companies to put in your watch list. So that's it for Section 4. We'll see you over in Section 5. Take care.